shows uh, first. So um, has anyone looked at these books? Okay, so you have, okay, very good. Um, by the way, I wanna talk to you over the break. Um, I mean, because basically someone's really desperately looking for someone to learn how to fix an on-prem computer, you too. And there was someone who was willing to even train you. <laughs> So it's like a job, but uh, we can talk about it. So if you're interested in learning how, how to actually fix a Hadoop cluster, there is a research operation in uh, economic. I'll talk to you about it. Um, all right. So last time, you know, I we were just speculating. I was speculating what was happening under the hood in distinct. So I, I guess we, because we moved to Spark SQL and data frames and data sets land, we're mainly focused on the analytics layer without fully understanding what's happening under the hood. Usually that's how a lot of data science is done, but at some points you need to really know what's going on under the hood also. So um, two things, if you, so this high performance Spark book, right? If you click it directly, it'll go to O'Reilly but this book actually is available in our library, right? Uh, as an ebook. Um, so I strongly recommend uh, sort of you look at this. Uh, the other one also, I think the definitive guide. Um, so this should also be in the library, I think, yeah. So all three books I think I ordered, uh, but the first one, the high performance spark is what I would, look at to, to sort of properly understand. Um, so, yeah, so here's, you know, uh, this is Holden Carew and uh, um, co-author. So they, you know, they sort of explain things a lot more calmly and slowly, uh, how Spark works, what are the RDD properties and so on. So I just gave you very, very small pieces here and there, but we may want to dive deeper as we, as we need to and want to. Okay, so the partitions, um, there's a couple of partitioner, there are different types of RDD. Um, so the, the most important thing when we do reduce by key is there is this uh, paired RDD. Um, and this paired RDD has uh, certain uh, types of uh, partitioners you can invoke on it. So these are rules on how to assign which key value pair to which partition, right? And there's sort of two basic ways of doing it. One is called the hash partitioner that takes a key, hashes it and mods it by the number of partitions and then throws it in there. And there's another one uh, called the range partitioner, which will take a key, like say integers or something, and then it'll try and uh, allocate, uh, no, a, a range of things into different partitions. So there are two standard ones, and then you can write your own partitioner. So if you chase this a bit somewhere, I think I opened this. I finally gave up. I really don't like electronic copies. Uh, so I ordered these books for myself. So I'll, 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 I'll have a much quicker way to find things. But yeah, it's, um, it, it's all here. Right? Um, so, in some sense, yeah, this is basically how you hash partitioning and range partitioning. And you can play with this even in Databricks and, and, and C. You know, later on, say if you write the CSV file after partitioning, you can actually see where you wrote it and you will see in the directory, there will be some park 0, 0, 001, park 0, 0, 002. So there'll be parts. It literally writes the different files, right? So you can also check and see if what you think is going on is what's going on. Okay, um, I, I will leave this there. So this is where you should go if you wanna kind of understand things carefully. Last time we were here, yes, before this, how do you figure out what's happening in distinct? So, um, yeah, so you know, when you go to the, um, so you can go to the, 
uh, API, Docs API, and you can look at things like this. And then it'll give you some, some level of information. Let me see, where was I? Okay, so let's see. So let's say we go here and we look at Scala and then in uh, Scala, I have, um, let's see. Let's see if I have this here, no, here maybe. <laughs> Sorry, so bad. Uh, yeah, sorry, I opened the whole, right. So, so here's where you're normally, right? So you can go to API docs and choose Scala and that's what opens this, right? So, um, and then you can search. So here it's root org, Apache Spark and RDD. And then you can look at uh, um, various um, methods here. So if we do um, so distinct um, is here, it's one of the methods, right? So normally what it is okay, this just quickly tells you what distinct does, return approximate number of distinct elements or, or sorry, return the exact number of distinct element here. This is, a, yeah, this is a, another method that does an approximate, um, version that's a lot faster. So then what you have to do is go to go to the top and then you drop down to the Scala source code. This seems <laughs> like, you know, but this is all uh, you can do actually. And this is a good thing to be uh, comfortable with, right? Because open source projects are like this. Like lots of people are contributing all the time, 107 contributors, it evolves fast. So then when you drop in here, um, I think I opened a few things, so it's a little, Okay, so I went to, I just searched distinct. You can also look at it locally on your system, right? So we could clone the whole repo. So then, um, okay, so what is this doing? So here is the method. Uh, it's returning a new RDD containing the distinct elements in this RDD, right? And uh, so let's see. Um, and then it's it's actually calling this method distinct partitions dot length, right? So, so it will take uh, the the total number of partitions in the RDD and call this method again, right? So this is sort of overloaded, so it'll call this. So this distinct call will call this, okay? And it assumes that uh, that the the elements have an implicit ordering in them, okay? Um, and um, so anyway, so if you, if you look at this without diving too deep, so you say, okay, this says remove duplicates in partition. <laughs> the, 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 the documentation is generally going to be quite sparse with these things. So it's obviously removing duplicates inside each partition somehow, right? So it's actually, if you look at it a bit more, it uses an external append only map. It's some kind of map with like a key value pair, like dictionary in Python. So it's using some kind of a fancy map to you know, essentially use null values for the values and simply use the, the key property of the map to basically merge, okay? And so, uh, and then if you notice a bit more when it's done this, because it's, you know, so this map is what this map is. It's, uh, and then it's uh, insert everything in, um, um, you know, by calling this partition map method. So everything in the partition, it's basically using this extend external append only map to make things uh, remove duplicates, okay? Once that's done, um, it's going to then see if the number of partitions is the same as the, the length of the partitions. And if it is the case, it's going to, uh, you know, remove duplicates in partition um, is called using this map partition method. So this is basically a function that's getting passed and then it, it preserves the partition. But if you, if it's not, then it does this uh, reduce by key, calls reduce by key under the hood. That's what does the, the shuffling, you know, the, the wide dependencies. So that's one kind of level of understanding this. If you want to go a bit deeper, 
you can. I mean, in the top of the source code, it tells you to read this paper, which I also linked. So you, maybe this is the must read paper to understand Spark. Okay, so then uh, um, where was I? So I think you can go into this external, um, uh, yeah, external up and only map and you can kind of look at what this is doing uh, at different levels. So this is a developer API. Um, yeah, um, it's, it spills sorted content to, to disk uh, when there is insufficient space for it to grow. So it's like a safe way of like getting things. Um, and then if, 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 if the map gets too big, it basically can spill the disk, right? It's kind of a safe way of happening. Uh, and then this is, yeah, you need to know a little bit about combiners and, um, you know, a few other things, which uh, then unfortunately, uh, then you basically need to know what's a builder, a combiner, a splitter. So now we have to go a little deeper into Scala. So it comes back to this, right? So you have this sort of architecture parallel collections library, this idea of a splitter, a combiner, um, and it's not too complicated, but uh, you know, you, you just have to dive deep. And I'm not expecting you to dive, uh, you dive as deep as you want. And ideally you should reach a point where you can dive as deep as you want and you can help others, right? Because there are many levels of understanding and using the code. It's the, okay, that's the main point I wanted to make. Um, so now let's go back to today's stuff. Um, so last time we were here, I kind of made a bit of a mistake trying to read this uh, um, in, a, in a careful way, but I think uh, sort of fixed this. Okay, this is uh, one way, and then I showed you the GUI way of, of, of uploading. That's, that's always convenient. This is uh, another method, okay? So have you been, have you, all of you gone through these cells and should we kind of march through them or, okay. Yeah, a little bit. Okay, a little bit. Okay, sure. Um, so anyway, what we, what we are trying to do basically is uh, get you a little deeper into Spark SQL. Okay, uh, and um, so this exercise sort of um, takes the social media usage data um, and then tries to um, use Spark SQL to um, do, do many operations, right? So let me stop the cluster. Well, okay, while the cluster is starting, let's look at today's plan. Um, so I will go through this a little bit more, um, but uh, 70 is, is mainly sort of, yeah. So there are a few things in 70 we may want to know, especially about Parquet files. This forms an incredibly core component of a lot of uh, distributed file systems. It's, a, it's an optimi optimized way problem optimized way to store large tables. So I will mention a little bit about it. Um, and data frame readers and data frame writers are important to know. That's how you can, you can you know, interact with uh, writing these files and you can have your own writers uh, if needed, right? So 70, we will go through a little bit. Uh oh. Cluster in not a usable state. Yeah. All right. So Maybe let me um, let me actually show you this while the cluster is lo loading. So Parquet is a columnar format that is supported by many um, big data systems. 
And what is it? It's a columnar storage format uh, that uh, essentially allows you to do various optimizations. So here it's this paper by Google. So let's sort of download this and sort of look at some Um, so it's Dremel originally, and uh, so the main idea is, uh, this is the main idea. So, so normally in a table, you have rows, right? R1, R2, and so on. And this is row-oriented or racket-oriented, right? But you can actually take the first column and then, uh, you know, essentially break the rows in groups. That's what these little, this is one group, uh, so this is R1, one grouping, this is another grouping and so on. But you basically do a column oriented um, representation. And the idea here is uh, you, you know the type, so you can do various compressions and so on. And if you say, for example, are trying to do a filter query on the top, then you can actually rearrange the query and say, bring the filter all the way down to the file scan level. See, these are the so-called predicate pushdowns. So because uh, it's column oriented and optimized, so for each filter on a specific column, you can push the filter predicate all the way down. So you don't read what you are going to filter anyway. That's like a, well, yeah, that's one example. There's a, there's a lot more details, but, uh, but essentially um, the main thing is uh, the sort of nested columnar storage with groups of rows coming together. Right? So um, you should read this if you really want to understand a bit more. Um, and what else is, uh, yeah. Uh, right. So the other thing you want to know about, uh, about writing uh, large tables is how to partition the data so that you can take advantage of certain uh, columns. Say, for example, you are trying to do a table like this, uh, the whether is gender, so say roughly half are males and the other half are females, then you can actually uh, use a partition by operation, of the column name, and what it will actually do is create a, a file hierarchy structure that basically will put all the, all the male um, elements in, in literally this sort of directory. And it'll actually have the directory name as gender equals male. And this one be gender equals female. So this is in, in fact another very efficient way of uh, using file hierarchies to, to, to write. Right? So when you write a large file, you, 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 you do it using this sort of partition structure. Um, there's a lot more details. Okay, let's uh, let's go. Let's go here. Okay, so um, let's see what I have in my, so I, I was doing something Wednesday and I want to know Spark catalog list tables gives me all the, all the tables that are in my, in my clusters uh, catalog, my, in my shard here. And Wow, it's, uh, it's taking some time. There we go. So what do I have? I have something called social media usage. And then there is something called social media usage, something, something. So I probably did some operations already. So this should show me the full name. So yeah. So this is the one I think we made last time, CSV GUI, right? And if you look at it, it's a, it's a managed table. 
and uh, it's actually a permanent table, right? Um, and then it's not uh, temporary. This one is also, this one I wrote earlier, I think. So let me show you a little bit. Uh, so in this data, I think this is what I did. I, I sort of grabbed it with get lines. And I think I updated this in the last binary push um, of the DBC archive file. And then, the, yeah, it says that when I use this uh, Scala IO source from URL for convenience and stuff, doubly getting and going through the local file, distributed file, or using the GUI, then I, I, I have to grab this header um, and I process it. Um, so anyway, what I'm doing is uh, I'm parallelizing uh, this, these lines at the sequence, and then I'm saving it as text file. So the order gets jumbled. That's why I, I sort of have to hold the header, right? Just because I, I wanted to like this um, programmatically. So then I can read the, the text file um, and make string out of it. I see that that's exactly what I need. And then I, um, I can make my, my um, data frame by reading from here, okay? Uh, so let me see. Uh, oh yeah, header is not there. Yeah, sorry, I have to run this again. Um, let's see, it might. Uh... Yeah, so okay. So then, um, so this is kind of a slightly convoluted way, right? Because I'm only writing the, the contents of the text file and then I'm just sort of, uh, anyway, um, it's a bit silly. I should at least save this um, header. Um, yeah, I have one question here. Yeah. Uh, this, um... Uh, if we uh, see this method, social uh, media uh, yeah. DF, data, data frame, yeah, and then two DF data, what is happening? Uh, oh, it's a method. Uh, it it converts it to a data frame mm -hmm. because the problem is if you if you don't do this, uh, I mean, I want to convert to a data frame with these header columns, mm -hmm. right? Agency platform URL date and visits. I mean, this is maybe the worst way to show you how to do this. I, it's like a fancy way, right? I, the GUI way. So if you want to read the stuff that's in the GUI, you can you can directly um, uh, read the table, right? Because we loaded the table already. Um, yeah, so and then this colon underscore star is uh, Scala's uh, syntax for iterate through all the elements in, in, in this array. Mm -hmm. So you can just... Say this. Oh, yeah, we should count. Because with the, uh, the old code, we, got, we missed like eight words or something. Oh, really? Yeah, including oh, the header. That's why it didn't work. <laughs> oh, oh, right. No, the old one, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Well, this is correct. Yeah. Yeah, the old one, you know, the problem was this. I used, because this is a, this is a, this is an iterator, right? So every time I call it, I lose stuff. So I was playing around. I don't know what I was yeah. trying to do this in a hurry. Um, because otherwise you kind of st are stuck to loading it with the GUI and it's a bit annoying for you because you can load fairly large files like this. Um, so that's why I thought it might be good to do some homework problems where we just download from somewhere instead of, you know, so that it's all part of your next assignment. By the way, you are all able to see the assignment. What? Oh, yeah. I mean, especially you two, right? The you, you, the PhD students, you should be able to see it. I think. Yeah. Would you would you check actually you two? I'm yeah, because I'm not sure what. Yeah, you're in a different category.
Yeah, you, you can see it, right? Okay. Okay, you don't? Yes. Yeah, okay, brilliant. Yeah, so it's, you have to do it in Databricks because we're using one, the last thing is about Python, how to do something in Python, and you should slightly figure it out by Googling. I mean, but, um, yeah, and, and basically, yeah, I think the instructions are clear. Okay, so then, um, so anyway, I, I'm gonna create a temp table name and then do create or replace temp view with this temp table name. So this is social media usage temp. So let's see in this catalog I had, was there social media usage temp? No, okay, so. Um, so then we can create, a, so we are gonna take this data frame and then say create or replace temp view is the method and you can do this. So once you do this, um, yeah, it should show up now. There's the third table, it's temp. So now if you see that it's a table type is temporary, it's true. So this is a very common way to take a data frame and turn it into this sort of registered temp table. So it's available and then you can do, yeah, all kinds of things with it in SQL directly usually. So this is a registered temporary view. So, um, and then this is why my social media usage is there. If you want a permanent table, you basically follow these steps. I have this math mode over right here because I, I already have this, right? Save as table. So these are two useful uh, commands to know of how to take a, a data frame and uh, have it available uh, in, as, a, as a table. So now, the difference between the two is mainly that this permanent table is gonna be available when you go and restart a cluster, it can be available. Um, 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 so that, you know, different people can work on it. So often in a, in a yeah, in, in a, in a, in a whatever, realistic setting, you will have tables that uh, many people will actually um, be, um, uh, be using. Okay. Um, so then, um, once you once you have um, this table, you can say you can get a data frame from a table like this. Okay. So you can always go back to data frame land, and. And then you can do all your standard Databricks operations. I suppose one nice thing I should show you is, um, yeah, so this is the kind of thing you can do. So if you, why are you creating a table? Because one of the standard things is that you can do SQL directly on the table. So that's, uh, Generally very useful. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, uh, I think people, is this how you learn? This is more of standard SQL, right? So this, this helps a lot, right? Um, Or you can do select star. Ah, select star from social media usage. So this will select all the columns. So in Databricks, it gives you this display environment. But uh, yeah, so you can play around with this. And then every time you do this type of thing, uh, you, you get only the top thousand rows. Um, so it's it's good enough for viewing and stuff, but you can also play with this. You can look at uh, I don't know pie chart, 
and plot options are So say ID oops, URL really values. Yeah. Uh, this is stupid. Uh, let's try. Am I doing plot chart? Let's try plot chart. So let's see. Um, platform as keys. IDs as values. Okay. So I mean, yeah, you can play around. There's quite a lot of different options here. So you can just get an idea of how many. Um, how many events are falling into different uh, So here it says that uh, it's based on the first thousand rows. Click and re-execute the maximum result limits. So you can do this. So what? What happened? So normally if you do this, it'll it'll basically execute it for everything. So I'm not really sure. Oh, something happened here. What did we have? We had bar chart with keys as date and ID as values, right? No, keys as URLs and I, platform, sorry. <laughs> uh, there we go. So now when I do the sum, Yes, this makes sense. So then, okay, it looks like it's already processed everything. I, I don't know, right? This is 5 million or, right? Okay, um, but yeah, just be aware that if it says you're, it's only processed the first thousand, then it's only processed the first thousand. Okay, this is the main reason we, we want to create a table because we can do SQL directly and it's it's available for us. It's uh, it's in distributed memory and uh, cache. If the table is too big, then we will see later, you will write it as a parquet file and then just read it as you need. Okay, so that's the other. Um, okay, so, so you go to data frame and here you can print schema. Yeah. So, so we have agency platform URL date and number of visits. And let's see, um, this is correct. Select platform. So, and we have this many platforms. Of course, uh, we can do a distinct and find the number of platforms and we know what distinct does now. Removes duplicates in each partition. And so we can do like a few more things now, like we can ask, uh, let's see, we can do, um, da, 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 the dot, uh, so if you do, do get num partitions, Platforms does not have get num partitions, right? So you have to first convert to RDD and then only you can see this. Two partitions. Okay. Um, anyway, the, this, is, this is fine because my system does two by default. Um, So I can do this and count the number of platforms, and display the unique platforms. 
Okay, so the other things are SQL and Data Frame API. Uh, Python is super useful. So a lot of times what we will do is when we switch later on to deep learning and things like this, we will move completely into PySpark plan, okay? There we may use Scala to do pre-processing and stuff like this, but once we, we will usually checkpoint and in some parquet file, basically write the data frame somewhere, and then we can read from PySpark um, and, and, and do stuff. So there it's basically the same, right? Spark.sable, blah, blah, blah. In Python, you have to cover these, you know, to terminate it like this, but it's almost the same. Okay, so we already saw this. Um, Okay, so here um, using string expressions. So you for select, you just can give column names as strings. Um, but with this dollar thing, it's actually equivalent to saying column. And for expressions, uh, you, you really need to use this sort of either this dollar notation or you know column. Um, because some, some methods actually expect you to pass a, a set of column objects, which are, you know. And sometimes it's okay to pass strings as names of columns, so it depends. So often when you have multiple data frames that you're trying to join, yeah, data frame one by column A and data frame eight by column B, then you, it gets kind of, you, you need to keep track of which data frame and which column and so on. Okay, so that's it. This is all like functional way of writing SQL basically, right? Um, um, the main reason we're doing it like this is so that later on, if you start rolling your own machine learning pipelines, it'll be a lot easier to do this and you have full control this way. Okay, using columns to filter. So we select um, and filter. So you see now I have an expression. So I usually can either do dollar sign like this, uh, or I pass the whole thing as an SQL expression and as a string, right? That's, that's another way to do this. Um, I think there is actually, you will see this other syntax as well. So let's try this. Um, I think, uh, let's try this. Forget this notation. So I think you can do filter. Is it this? I think. Yeah. So this is a um, Spark allows you to do. So this is the same as you know dollar quote, it's another shortcut. Um, so let's just make sure this works. So anyway, um, and I think just to be a bit pedantic. Um, you can also do it like this. This is a DF dot select visits, and then you can do filter. I think this should also work. Column of visits. Let's see. I think yes. You have to yeah. This should also work. Okay, whatever. Um, so I'm the, sorry, the reason I'm showing all this is you're gonna see all, all kinds of permutations all over the code. So it's just a, good to be aware of this. So then uh, we can select, filter, uh, show. So, Okay, so now we've sort of selected agency platforms and visits and filtered by only SMS. Yes. Um, yeah, Databricks gives you these little 
whatever, bright ideas. Not sure what this one is. Excellent queries. Yeah. Yes, so we will probably do a little bit of Delta Lake operations later. It's talking about um, uh, optimize Z order by command and Delta table. Does anyone know what a Z order curve is? Okay, so it's uh, so bored with SQL. Let's <laughs> do something random for a minute. So uh, Z order curves uh, should be in Wikipedia, yes. So these are a family of space filling curves. Okay, so what is this? It's a, it's a way to encode objects in say two dimensions or three dimensions as, uh, as though they appear in a 1D uh, sequence. Right? So these are essentially you know, uh, increasingly refining uh, you know, families of, of Z-order curves. So this is the fourth iteration of Z-order curves. So if you, may, if you imagine points being here, in 2D, you can somehow index them in 1D. As it's, it's, it's such that points that are closer in 2D, in Euclidean distance, appear closer on the 1D as well, with a very high probability. And, the, and there are algorithms to, to, to kind of guarantee um, which range in the 1D curve we should look at to make sure that all the neighbors are caught, right? And this is super, super, Super nice because uh, you can. So this is a bit relieving and so on. So why is this nice? It's because if you have um, data with multiple columns, it's like having here we have two columns, right? Values. Um, um, what what you might want to be able to do is to uh, order them in partitions so that you know they're multi-dimensional. Uh, similarity, I mean, wh where they live, is taken into account when we do the partitioning. And why this is super useful is it's exactly the same intuition I gave for Parquet file, where you have predicate pushdowns, and you know, you can take filters. And so if you, if you know you don't want this range for X, but you want this range for Y, then it basically will translate to looking for, you know, some subsets of the Z order curve. So then you know, oh, I only need to look at this partition and that partition, for example, right? Super high level, but that's, that's the main idea. And it's kind of the main technology in, in this, uh, um, you know, in this other file system called Delta IO, which basically overloads on Parquet. It, it takes Parquet files, briefly mentioned, and then it adds a bit more metadata and then uh, it allows something called asset transactions for database people. So anyway, that's some random excursion. So let's uh, continue here. Um, okay, so here, what, I'm just showing the five things here. Um, and so what else? So coalesce is a very useful function. So coalesce will actually um, um, combine values together. Uh, and lit is how you will get like a column of all zeros. So it's a literal. So it's a basically give me a column of all zeros. And um, then what else? Um, so here we're going to make a fixed data frame, uh, DF, uh, select agency platform URL date, and then we're going to coalesce all the visits uh, with this literal zero uh, and call this visits. And then we're going to filter uh, the platform is not total. So, Okay. All right. Okay, I think I'm gonna stop. I don't wanna, I'm getting, you know, you can read this. Let's move on to other things. Okay, Arif. Uh, so let's take a break. 
Yeah. But this is written for you to go through on your own because mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, yeah, to read it and slowly go through this. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a lot of details on monotonically increasing IDs, which is a nice function you can add. Uh, just play around with it. Mm. Okay, so all the homework I kind of want you to go through um, on your own. This parquet thing is something I briefly mentioned, but but kindly look at it as well uh, because um, yeah. So we 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 would like to move on to uh, these three things today, right? You can look at pivoting. It's if you've done databases, this is all like. Basically, the slight variation will be how to do it in a distributed system if you haven't had distributed systems, but it's mostly syntax and for you to catch up on your own. So what I would like to focus next is uh, these, these three notebooks because we only have 15 minutes left. So let's start in maybe 10 or 15 or 14 minutes, okay? Yes. <clears throat> And Arif, if you have any questions, you know, you can, uh, yeah, you can ask uh, once you've gone through the, the material. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I told you earlier that uh, there's Spark Core, which is where RDDs basically live, all the low level stuff. And then there is Spark SQL, which provides like API abstractions on top of RDDs and specifically data frames and data sets. And you can drop into manage tables and come back. So that's generally where analytics and a lot of data science starts. Then the next uh, main thing we have is machine learning library. So this again is uh, one of the Spark libraries that sits on top of Spark core. So that's kind of where we're going to. And this is essentially where we do some kind of extract, transform, load operations of raw data and uh, set it up uh, as part of this sort of machine learning pipeline workflow, right? So these two are baby examples, but uh, it's, uh, we'll do more complicated ones soon in the SQL. And hopefully for your project, you will do something really interesting, right? Um, so this is the sort of six steps. Um, so today we're in um, sort of the ETL and EDA step. This is exploratory data analysis and the exploratory um, uh, ext extract transform load and exploratory data analysis. So step one is to load the data uh, as a data frame. Step two is to understand the data. Um, yeah, compute statistics, create visualizations to get a better intuition for the data. So this is usually called exploratory data analysis. And then later on, we will start getting into a machine learning framework. So we use our sort of basic probability model that the data is uh, independent and identically distributed. And so we can split the data randomly into two parts. We hold out part of it and for testing and then use the remaining for training. And uh, after we do some training with this data, we can um, extract features, uh, learn some models. So for example, we can run a decision tree uh, to learn how to predict a diamond's price from a description of the diamond. So that can be something useful, right? Uh, and then we can tune the model. So how do you, how do you, you know, make an optimal trade-off between complexity, how complex the model gets, and uh, uh, generalizability, how you can still, you know, not overfit, but be able to predict reasonably well for new data. So, and then finally, step five, we will evaluate the model. Um, so basically, look at how well the data is doing uh, with the test set, and, uh, we can sort of compare the initial model with the tune model to see the benefits of how tuning parameters um, of, of the model helps us. So for a decision tree, the standard tuning parameter is how deep you allow the tree to grow. Have people seen decision tree before, everyone? Okay. Has anyone not seen decision trees? Okay, good. 
If you have not seen it, there are some animations you can you can look at linked a lot of content here. Um, okay, so in this notebook, we're only going to do step one and two, right? And this kind of a pipeline is the same everywhere, right? So you have some sort of, yeah, something like this always in machine learning pipelines. Okay, so uh, how do we load the data? So this is part of this Databricks data sets, which is nice and curated for us already. Uh, and it's in our data sets and it's a CSV, um, ggplot2, diamonds.csv. So that's where our, um, our CSV file is. So we can just uh, do sc.txt file and just sort of take two. So this is just sort of a RDD level view uh, of it. And then, okay, we see that um, it has carrot, cut, color, clarity, depth, and so on. Um, and then it has uh, actual uh, values coming up soon, right? So uh, we can then say, okay, we can use uh, SQL context read um, uh, or spark.read format, CSV, option header true, option infer schema true, load diamonds file path. Okay. So, uh, so the default delimiter is comma. Bit cold actually. Okay, so then uh, we can print schema. So um, I have like two X jobs currently working with the the, with the company uh, in northern Sweden, and uh, <laughs> this part is eighty percent of the thesis. It's hard work, really hard work. So. Uh, Oh, the most important thing about our pipeline here is it's completely scalable. So if you have terabytes of diamond data, everything works. That's the main point of the course. Yeah. So we have uh, X, Y, Z, which is some measurements of the diamond um, on the axis and various features here. Right? Uh, and the price is what maybe we want to predict. Okay, so, so we have null values are allowed and so we only have 53,940 records in this table. We can show like this, it's the top 10. This will work in Spark Shell. This play won't work in Spark Shell. So then, uh, yeah, this is our main idea. So we have the column price, which is a double. And we really want it to be recast as a double because if you, if you saw here, uh, the price was an integer because that's what automatic inference did. Because, you know, if, if you kind of look at the actual values, they are probably as integers, I think. Yeah. It's 326 price, yeah. So because it's actually coded as an integer, so Scala's automatic inference missionary will cast it as an integer. But maybe we we'll want that to be a double. Um, so then how do you turn that double? It's basically, you can take import org spark SQL types double type and simply do dollar price, which is this column uh, price and then dot cast double type. And then you can rename it as price. Okay, let's just give it the same name. Okay, so this should basically do it. So if you now print schema, uh, price is double, right? So, and then uh, these things are string, that's fine. Okay, so we now only have strings and doubles. Um, okay, and of course this will show the dot zero now. It's, it's dot zero, doubles. Okay, so uh, this is uh, Databricks, so we can sort of, do this and uh, we can play around with the plots. Um, yeah. Scatter, let's try something. 
Um, so let's see, carrot, price, uh, So we have carrot price. Let's throw all the doubles here. Uh, maybe depth. Okay, so pairwise scatter plots are quite nice. Uh, mm. What else is? Uh, this is some kind of a size of the diamond. Three axes, I guess. Okay, so okay, you kind of get the idea. So you can, you know, this is one of the basic things you try to do. I'm not sure if I do this down here, probably. Okay, so you can do the scatter plots and look at what's going on. There is price here, and um, you can see how each of these variables are. So you can see, for example, uh, I don't know, it's a bit hard with this many plots, but you can see how the price is, is distributed. There's some very pricey diamonds and some sort of not so, uh, and, and it, it depends on, yeah. So um, whatever. So the nice thing is you can always just go back to table view and give it. Understanding the data. Well, so the categorical features, the discrete features, the string, uh, are cut, clar color, and clarity. And these are continuous features, depth, x, y, and z, right? And price is what we're going to predict. So usually that's the response or the predictor, OK? <laughs> So then uh, we, can, we can start looking at uh, how many elements are in, in say, a cut, right? So this is, you can just look at this and sort of, so these are our strings, okay? So there's ideal, premium, good, premium, good, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we can just do cut and distinct and simply show how many distinct types of cuts there are, right? So it's premium, idle, good, fair, very good. So these are the, like the basic things you would do, right? So um, categorical variables and so the same with clarity. So there's these measures of clarity, VVS2, SI1. I actually forgot what these things mean now, but uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, you can play around, uh, play around with making plots and stuff. We've already done this in a scatter plot way. Um, so then let's look at, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, if you do plot options, display type, histogram plot and choose plot over all the cells, then you can basically get uh, a very detailed view of histograms. Let's just quickly look at this. What do I do? Keys. What? Am I going wrong? Uh, What am I doing wrong? So what should I do for histogram plot? Oh, so let's see, I need carrot and ID as values. Oh, sorry, the other way. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I didn't see, I, I only saw one field earlier. Did you notice? Weird. <laughs> okay, so 
you can, yeah, whatever. So you can, uh, let's see, let's make this completely crazy. So I would do simple things like this. Uh, why? Because, you know, we're gonna use random forests. Um, so you kind of want to get an idea of, you know, how the data is distributed because it, it's basically a, a partitioning tree, a space partitioning method. Uh, so anyway, um, let's move on. Um, so yeah, the, this, this histogram shows that carrots have a skewed distribution, right? Many diamonds are small. So it's, uh, that's the main, 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 main idea here to look at histograms. Um, it's the other way around. I don't know why it doesn't. Uh... <laughs> um... Oh, let's see, what do I want? I want my keys to be uh, carrots, right? And my values to be ID. Okay, so, and then I want the aggregation to be count. Okay. Yeah, so Yeah, so I think this is kind of the the main the main point to to get out of here. Um so linear regression can cause, cause issues with this. Um, so this is the other important point, <laughs> always plotting a subsample from the data. Um, and you can ask this other question, right? How am I going to be sure that the distribution is skewed if I can't see all of it, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, that will happen a lot with big data. The only thing we can do is uh, is to do random subsampling of the data. So there is this method called sample. I don't know if we do this here, but later on, this is too small because here we can just say, I really hope this works. Something is odd with. Okay, yeah, it worked. So this time it's, uh, it's showing yeah, based on the first 10,000. Um, so what you do actually is, uh, you know, when you, when you take a data frame, you can always do um, a, a subsampling of it. So you can control, you can do multiple random subsamplings of it. Um, I kind of, let's see, how much time do I have? So I can do diamonds, ef dot um, sample, I think. Yeah. And I, I think that's correct. Yeah, so this will give you a random sample uh, of 10% uh, of the thing, right? And you can change the seed. I mean, this is basically all you can do. Uh, so you can basically get different random samples. You can also do stratified random sampling. So you know how some part of the data looks like and so on. This is kind of an art, but uh, yeah, that's basically what you can do. Um, okay, so yeah, so you can do, yeah, you can kind of start exploring this. Um, cut and carrot and uh, do some joint distributions and so on. So let's try to do a scatter plot. Um, 
And I think I already did this for you, the pairwise continuous scatter plot. So you can do this and start. So there's, you know, we saw this earlier, there's quite a lot of patterns, right? So it seems like when the price went up, where was it? Ay, ay, ay. It's, let me try one last time. Maybe it will just work. Good. Good. Right, so it looks like you see, for example, uh, X, um, uh, Z, and also Y. So this is like something about the size of the diamond. When those values are big, you see, the prices are also big, right? Um, so obviously the bigger the diamond, the, the, I mean, this is obvious, but there is patterns in the data, right? There are the other things that are a bit more subtle, um, but, uh, and also the price is a bit crazy, right? Because there is like this cheap diamonds and then suddenly there's this super expensive diamond. So, um, so anyway, let's let's go with, uh, with with building some kind of a random forest. Where were we? Yeah. So yeah, of course. So you also do SQL to to kind of understand the data better. So this is diamonds um, colored. Um, that are diamonds that are decolored, for example. So this is. Select this filter by D, and then you can see what the price is for them, and so on. Okay. Um, so then we can look at uh, tables we have. There is no diamond table, so we can do, and we don't want to make a permanent table because we're just messing around. So you can also do create or replace temp view, take this data frame, and then now you're gonna get a temporary table here. Yeah, it's temporary. And you can do SQL directly, so yeah. Um, what else can we do? Um, you can, yeah, do it like this and same thing. Right, so the idea is to basically slice and dice the data, SQL and or yeah. Select carrot color price from diamond stable where color is D example. You can use pure SQL now like this and then directly get a data frame from this table you've temporarily made. Okay. Um, so you can also do things like this, clarity, like, you know, so this will get anything that has clarity with some V in it. So you can do like uh, fuzzy string matching, partial string matching, things like this. Okay, so often these kinds of things will be useful to clean the data, because often the data will be kind of messy and dirty. Um, okay. So, so this is just a million different SQLs. So now let's order by price. So this is kind of nice to know, right? Select clarity, carrot, carrot, pie from price. Um, I mean, select carrot, clarity, and price from diamonds, order by price in descending order. So this is kind of convenient syntax. So you can see that, okay, the carrot 2.29 has the highest price. And so it looks like the carrot is directly correlated, I mean, proportional to price, which makes sense. Um, and you can also, yeah, select more things and see what happens. Okay. Um, So now we can um, look at the price uh, in ascending order. So you order by, so yeah, this is select carrot clarity price from diamonds, order by carrot 
in ascending and price descending, right? So carrot is increasing, and then the, the price per carrot is in descending order, right? So this is uh, generally useful. Ah. Yeah, you have to click on it and then you can scroll down, okay? So anyway, that's uh, some SQL on this example. Um, so you can also sort by multiple fields and limit to the first five, right? Um, yeah. This is probably bad if you say this, maybe in the real world, maybe your boss will not like you. <laughs> but yeah, it's, you should really do capital select and stuff because people are used to this. Okay, so you can do select carrot clarity price from diamonds order by carrot descending price descending and then this limit. So all these things are really nice because you know you can just sort of directly answer sort of questions from human language, right? It's the power of SQL. So I can also select average price as AVG price from diamonds. So this is quite nice, right? So that's the average price of all the diamonds. Um, select average, uh, but I'm now casting the price as an integer. Um, and this I'm calling average price. My suggestion is don't get too hooked on this. It's way better to write the, the, the functional style because then we have quite a lot of control. This we basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is basically we're aggregating, and then it's like uh, um, average price group by color. It's it's quite nice, right? So <clears throat> so SQL is great for aggregations uh, with filters and groupings and different kinds of orderings. That's like uh, the other programmatic way to, to uh, understand, uh, get intuition for a very large data set. This will work always, right? Because you're always looking at edge cases so you can limit by something and so on. Besides those two sort of visualizing random subsamples and SQL, uh, there's not a lot more one can do to like learn from a data set you have no idea about. Of course, you know, you usually work with domain experts, so they know all about the data, but so then you can get their knowledge, I mean, their expertise and go and work together. That's usually what you do in data science. Why do we need to know these interactive SQL queries? Such queries can help us explore the data and thereby inform the modeling process. It's so silly, that's what I wrote. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay, ETL pipeline. So the next one I wanted to quickly do is this other example where we are going to, uh, I think we do linear regression here. Then we also do random forests and a lot more. So this is a data set that you would have seen in most machine learning courses. It's this power plant pipeline example. Have you, have you seen this? Okay. Maybe it's from a, um, yeah, it's in like a lot of the libraries. So the idea is, uh, um, you know, so what is, first of all, we'll get some business understanding of the problem. So every problem will have some kind of a science or engineering or some kind of business problem. Um, then we load our data, explore our data, visualize our data, same basic steps. Later on, when we do a bit more on ML machine learning libraries and basics, then we will continue with these uh, uh, step five, six, seven, and eight, just like with the diamond one also. At that point, we'll get into data preparation, modeling. So data preparation often also involves like data, you know, transformation and all kinds of operations before you do the modeling. So all of that is done in a pipeline, okay? And then we tune and evaluate the model and then finally we do deployment as well. So it's kind of a baby deployment. So deployment means like you, you have a model that 
at the end of the day is basically some big thing sitting in some memory, right? And then you give it some input, it'll give you some output. It's, that's like abstractly what it is. It's formally you know, an estimator in mathematical statistical terms. So, um, so, when, so you have to basically deploy it somewhere so that when someone asks a question or query or whatever, this model you've trained will actually respond, right? Um, so that means there's some kind of a deployment setting. Okay, so what we will do is, uh, uh, our goal is to predict uh, the power output given a set of readings from various sensors in a gas-fired power generation plant. Okay, so gas-fired power generation is a not a trivial process. It's a, so it's a very complex process with lots of interacting components. And uh, so, yeah, and the engineers are the ones with the feet in the fire and they, they do kind of all kinds of things to keep things going, right? But you can take the historical uh, measurements and then use it to, you know, predict in the sense that if, if, the, if the current gas fire plant is operating very similar to how it used to operate, then we can, and if the past is any reflection of the current state, then we can basically use this historical uh, patterns you know, to, to predict what will happen. That's, yeah. So that's basically all of statistically machine learning assumes something like this. Um, Okay, so yeah, so this is what we will do next time. So if you are interested, um, this is the uh, machine learning library. There's the RDD based API, which we will do some things in. And there's also a data frame API. There's a lot here. We will touch a few examples, uh, but you will you will be able to um, use these other models. Hopefully, when you do your project, you can do something like this or something more fancy with deep learning. Yeah, um, this is the power plant. Um, the actual power plant this data comes from, um, and here is the uh, machine learning repository at UC Irvine. And there are some characteristics of the data. Um, so the features are temperature, ambient pressure, relative humidity, exhaust vacuum, and then net hourly electrical energy output. Right? Um, the averages are taken from various sensors located around the plant. They record the ambient variables every second. Um, yeah. So this is basically the data. So. I mean, I think it should be three, one, two still. Yeah, this is just a quick trick. For now, it doesn't matter, but uh, there are some notebooks where the Spark version has to be greater than something and less than something. <laughs> so it's because some of the libraries have not caught up because the languages are in different versions, right? So sometimes you have to use some older version of Spark and so on. Um, just a quick test. Okay, so the problem, the problem is basically a regression problem because the, the variable we're trying to predict is continuous. This is called regression. If the variable we're trying to predict is discrete, it's called classification. Okay, so let's load our data and quickly look at it. Um, okay, so it has, uh, I think this is a tab separated variable TSV files. So sheet one, two, three, four, five, right? So what's, uh, now let's load this sort of text file method. Um, okay, so I'm just printing line by line. Okay, that's how it looks. Okay, fine. Uh, then, so we wanna require, uh, uh, Actually, while we are here, I want to, let's look at this one level deeper, right? So let's see what they have actually done. So if I do, uh, 
uh, sheet one. Let's see what's inside sheet one. Yeah. So there's only one file, right? Yes. I mean, there is no, there is no more directory inside it. Okay. Now I know what I did wrong or why I had to do to Johannes to this hack. You know, when I, when I got the data from uh, the URL, I should have, before I wrote this, this with file system, I should have called coalesce one and then I should have written it because then it would have made it all into one file. You, you can try it if you're bored. Because, because the problem was I was, I, yeah, I was directly writing it uh, as a distributed file. So this is a problem, right? Because you need the order, you need the first line, you need the first line. So I think I did something like this. Um, yeah. I have a <clears throat> yeah. Can I, uh, can I see, uh, can I, can I read this one? Uh, oh, is it too small? Uh, no, I'll, I, I, I can read this. Yeah. But if I write like a header, then yeah. sheet one dot uh, PSV. Oh no, no! I'm trying to explain why I did all the sort of hack with the with the other example, right? I mean, the the example of the social media usage, I, I was trying to do it in a hurry, in a fancy way, but mm -hmm. I think I did not coalesce. I mean, I, I need to try it because when I wrote it down and then I read it again, the first line wasn't the header line, so I must have written it already in in partitions. Mm -hmm. So I just was curious how they, they have coded the data. It looks like they've written it in one file, right? Right, because you guys haven't actually played with the, with the coalesce function. So you, coalesce is a, is a function. So you can, okay, let's do this slight detour. I'll delete this so it's good to know this. So let's do something simple, uh, sc dot um, parallelize. So we did, uh, let's say, Seek, I'm just going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I'm going to do comma two. Right. So, what will this do? I'm going to think about this a little bit. So, this creates a parallel collection RDD at parallelize, right? So, then if I write this, I forgot what method I use, what, what is it called? Uh, mm, because I converted this to an RDD, right? So, so I did a.df to df first, to df. So I made this a, a, um, a data frame, thank you. <laughs> and then I wrote it, right? Uh, what was it? Uh, uh, I think is it right dot uh, format. Okay, I think let's try right dot CSV. And let me give it uh, something, right? Um, okay, as whatever. Will this work? Let's see. Didn't I write it as CSV? I don't know what I did in that one. Uh, okay, so then what I would like to, <clears throat> to see is uh, what's exactly here. Ah, yes, good. So what you're seeing is, uh, let me make this tiny bit smaller. So what, I, what, what is going on if you, sorry. Okay, 
So I made two partitions, right? I told me told it explicitly to make two partitions, and then I okay, it's a parallel collections RDD, but then I'm going to write it as the CSV format somewhere, and this is where. So I'm looking at it. In here, there is a path tempras blah blah dot CSV, and inside there, there is something called underscore success. So successfully wrote, basically, it's a flag, and then there are several files. You see, there's a committed file, it's a started thing. But the most important one is this one, part zero, zero, blah, 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 dot CSV. And then there's part zero and part one, so the two parts, right? So we might want to know what is here, right? Uh, so, uh, man, what do I do? Uh, is it, let's do this. I think it's person FS head, right? Does this work? Yes. One, two, three. Right. And then if I do percent FS, uh, I mean, we can also read this form, but let's just do this quickly. So this should be, what did I do? Part one. Is this part one? Yes. So this should be the remaining, right? Four, five, six. So yeah, that's what I did wrong, right? So I, I got it and then I, I wrote it. So I don't know which part the header went into. And then when you read it back, it's not necessarily going to read, uh, you know, you know, order so that the first, so what I can do, for example, what I should have done is instead of this, I need, I should have done dot, I think, Coalesce one, maybe. Ah, it's going to complain. ADF, call this one. Otherwise, you have to set overwrite mode, blah, blah, blah. So now let's see what ADF one is. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think I did wrong. Um, so now you can actually see this. Right, uh, I'll just, I'm gonna delete all this anyway. Yes, so, um, so what I'm, I'm hoping is uh, you, you all have time to, <laughs> to play around with your community edition and figure things out like this, but maybe this is a bit weird detail you need to be shown at least once. But basically, what everything we write goes somewhere in some format, and and I wrote CSV right. If I say write parquet, it's the same thing. It will be, it'll be exactly like this, but it'll be parquet file, which we can't read easily unless you have a parquet reader. You have to read it as parquet. We can't do head because it'll be some compressed binary thing. But other than that, it's uh, and also it's a good idea to do percent fs. Uh, I think. Because I, I kind of don't want to, I always want to remove all the raw stuff. How do we, is it rm dash r here? I, I really don't know. I haven't used this. Okay. So it recursively removes uh, and then df, right? I, I just want to clean. Um, okay. Is that? Clear, Arif? I don't know yeah. if that was helpful or more confusing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's uh, let's do this. We take this, and then some requirements. And now we see we have to specify the delimiter as a tab. So backslash t is a tab character, and then we can see the schema. Those are the uh, different variables. Okay, so I, I won't go through this. I showed it last time. Um, you can also uh, upload this data set using the GUI like I showed last time. Just go to this. Some of the images have changed, but you go to data and table and so on. Okay. And here you can actually choose, you know, what you want in the drop down menu. 
Oh, are these guys here already? Okay. Uh, we have two more minutes. So, uh, so exploring your data. So I'll let you play with this, but basically uh, you can just start showing it, um, view it as a data frame. You can sort of um, do scatter plots and, and, um, and play around, right? So. Um, what else? So we can turn this into a managed table. Um, and yeah. yeah. So let's see, pipeline, pipeline. So now we can do SQL on it directly. And I'm gonna let you do your U tries and so on. Okay, so it's the same as uh, with the other data. There's some schema definitions and you can do some very basic statistical analysis by simply doing dot describe. It's a very powerful uh, way. You just get the min, max, mean, and all of these statistics that are for each one, right? The count, mean, standard deviation, min, and max. Then you can start visualizing your data. Um, so I will let you play with this and we will continue. So we're kind of done basically with uh, module one. Wikipedia click streams uh, is something you can look at it on your own. I'll assign it as a homework. It's the same idea. The only thing here is uh, we, you know, it's a different data set, but we're using SQL. The only difference here is I have some, uh, um, some visualizations that you can do. And for that, you just have to evaluate this once, um, this package, B3 package. It's all there in glorious detail because uh, you can basically use this display HTML to visualize uh, you know, some data frame that's turned into a JavaScript object that you can interact with. So this force crap. So this sort of looks at the, the clicks that are going in a Wikipedia page, like where does the referrer page come from into Wikipedia? And this is whatever, uh, various uh, Wikipedia pages. So sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's nice. It's just a demo to show that you can look at, you can get the output in any kind of HTML interact, including B3, which is data-driven documents or whatever. Okay, so go through this a little bit and then, uh, um, we will continue. I will upload the this ML thing to quite a lot coming up. And once we've gone through this, basically module one is over. So we probably have two more assignments, yes, because this is end of week two. Ah. Okay.